Hello friends, welcome and happy Halloween. It is time for my annual Halloween video and this year it's going to be a bit different. I, I like to do videos about, you know, some of the classic Universal movies or the Hammer films or something like that. But this year I just ran out of time. I didn't have the time to put something like that together. So instead we're going to do a spooky story and I hope you, uh, hope you enjoy it. But before we get into that, as is tradition, we must awaken Bela, who has slept all year in his custom-made coffin. Bela, of course, has his black shroud on. And there he is. Bela is a Jesse Jones creation that was created specifically for Halloween. Uh, Oh gosh, I guess it's getting close to 10 years ago now. And uh, yeah, this pipe only comes out at Halloween. A few days before, I spoke only Haunted Bookshop in it. And the night after Halloween, it is cleaned and put back into its coffin to rest for another year. So we will load Bela up with some uh, Haunted Bookshop, of course. And we will get this going, and then I'll tell you what we're going to be, what we're going to be having fun with tonight. So it is very close to Halloween. It is Thursday evening, so I believe Halloween is Saturday, maybe Sunday. I've lost track. It's upon us soon. It will be. Halloween. All right, so we got a nicely packed pipe. It's got to last us for a while. This is not a short story. Well, it is a short story, but it's not a very short one. Got my Halloween lighter. I love that image. And as always, I I wake Bela from his sleep, and he leaps to the uh, to the occasion. Wonderful pipe. Now, this whole past month, I've been using a variety of uh, Halloween themed tampers, and we got some great ones this year from Larry Black. And we've got the the Frankenstein monster, which I've been really enjoying, as well as this uh, witch on a broom. But Bela has his own tamper, which of course is Renfield. <laughs> Renfield was a gift from my, my dear friend Danny Shore. And uh, I only use Renfield when I smoke Bela, so they go together. And I think Danny would have liked it that way. So we'll get that tamped. And let's talk about what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to read you a story. It's a story by Charles Dickens. It's actually part of his Christmas collections. Um, it's a story that's not very well known, and probably because it's a bit non-traditional Dickens. Uh, although it does fit in well with things like A Christmas Carol in terms of the, the style and, and the, the overall topic. But... Uh, yeah, it's one of his lesser-known works, and I think that's a shame because I think it's a wonderful spooky tale for Halloween. It was written in 1866 and is entitled The Signalman. And the, uh, the book, the story, for the most part, takes place in the signal box of, of a signalman, which is in a sort of cutout that a railway tunnel exits into. So you've got a railway tunnel, the train comes out, and there's this narrow sort of rock passageway that the train goes through for a bit uh, before things open up. And down in that sort of very narrow valley is just enough room for a small hut that the signalman uh, passes his time in when he's not going out to, to do the things he does. 
And this is the story of a visitor who encounters him and what happens. So, without further ado, yeah, the lighting isn't good. I, I, I think we need to make better use of the disembodied head here. And believe me, this head could scare even... Uh, even the likes of Ichabod Crane. But uh, it just doesn't work with this lighting. So we're going to have to fix that. There we go. Much better. So we will put this back over here. So he can watch over us. Beyond that, I've got the glow of the computer, which will hopefully help me see. The Signalman by Charles Dickens. Hello below there. When he heard a voice thus calling to him, he was standing at the door of his box with a flag in his hand, furled round its short pole. One would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came. But instead of looking up to where I stood, on the top of the steep cutting nearly over his head, he turned himself about and looked down the line. There was something remarkable in his manner of doing so, though I could not have said for my life what. But I knew it was remarkable enough to attract my notice, even though his figure was foreshortened and shadowed down in the deep trench, and mine was high above him, so steep in the glow of an angry sunset that I had shaded my eyes with my hands before I saw him at all. Hello, below! From looking down the line, he turned himself about again, and raising his eyes, saw my figure high above him. Is there any path by which I can come down and speak to you? He looked up at me without replying, and I looked down at him without pressing him too soon with a repetition of my idle question. Just then, there came a vague vibration in the earth and air, quickly changing into a violent pulsation and an un oncoming rush that caused me to start back as though it had the force to draw me down. When such vapor as rose to my height from this rapid train had passed me and was skimming away over the landscape, I looked down again and saw him refurling the flag he had shown while the train went by. I repeated my inquiry after a pause during which he seemed to regard me with a fixed attention. He motioned with his rolled-up flag towards a point on my level, some two or three hundred yards distant. I called down to him, All right! and made for that point. There, by dint of looking close about me, I found a rough, zigzag, descending path notched out, which I followed. The cutting was extremely deep and unusually precipitate. It made through a clammy stone that became oozier and wetter as I went down. And for these reasons, I found the way long enough to give me a time to recall a singular air of reluctance or compulsion with which he had pointed out the path. When I came down low enough upon the zigzag descent to see him again, I saw that he was standing between the rails on the way by which the train had lately passed, in an attitude as if he were waiting for me to appear. He had his left hand at his chin, and that left elbow rested on his right hand, crossed over his breast. His attitude was one of such expectation and watchfulness that I stopped a moment, wondering at it. I resumed my downward way, and stepping out upon the level of the rail, and drawing nearer to him, saw that he was a dark, sallow man with a dark beard and rather heavy eyebrows. His post was in as solitary and dismal a place as ever I saw. On either side, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, excluding all view but a strip of sky, the perspective one way, only a crooked prolongation of this great dungeon, 
The shorter perspective in the other direction terminated in a gloomy red light and the gloomier entrance to a black tunnel in whose massive architecture there was a barbarous, depressing, and forbidden air. So little sunlight ever found its way to this spot that it had an earthly, earthy, deadly smell, and so much cold wind rushed through it that it struck a chill to me, as if I had left the natural world. Before he stirred, I was near enough to him to have touched him. Not even then, removing his eyes from mine, he stepped back one step and lifted his hand. This was a lonesome post to occupy, I said, and it had riveted my attention when I looked down from up yonder. The visitor was a rarity, I should suppose, not an unwelcome rarity, I hoped. In me, he merely saw a man who had been shut up within a narrow limits all his life, and whose being at last set free had a newly awakened interest in these great works. To such purpose I spoke to him, but I am far from sure of the terms I used. For besides that I am not happy in opening any conversation, there was something in the man that daunted me. He directed a most curious look towards the red light near the tunnel's mouth, and looked all about it as if something were missing from it, and, and then he looked at me. That light was part of his charge, was it not? He answered in a low voice, Don't you know it is? The monstrous thought came into my mind as I perused the fixed eyes and the saturnine face that this was a spirit, not a man. I have speculated since whether there may have been infection in his mind. In my turn, I stepped back, but in making the action, I detected in his eyes some latent fear of me. This put the monstrous thought to flight. You look at me, I said, forcing a smile, as if you have a dread of me. I was doubtful, he returned, whether I had seen you before. Where? He pointed to the red light. He had looked at it. There, I said. Intently watchful of me, he replied, but without sound. Yes. My good fellow, what should I do there? However, be that as it may, I never was there. You may swear. I think I may. He rejoined, yes, I, I am sure. I am sure I may. His manner cleared like my own. He replied to my remarks with readiness and in well-chosen words. He had much to do there. Yes, that was to say he had enough responsibility to bear, but exactness and watchfulness were what was required of him. And of actual work, manual labor. He had next to none to change the signal, to trim those lights, and to turn the iron handle now and then was all he had to do under that head. Regarding those many long and lonely hours which I seemed to make so much of, he could only say that the routine of his, of his life had shaped itself into that form, and he had grown used to it. He had taught himself a language down here, if only to know it by sight and to have formed his own crude idea of its pronunciation could be called learning it. He had also worked out fractions and decimals and tried a little algebra, but he had been as a boy a poor hand at figures. Was it necessary for him when on duty always to remain in that channel of damp air and could he never rise into the sunshine from between the high stone walls? Why, that depended upon times and circumstances. Under some conditions, there would be less upon the line than others, and the same held good as to certain hours. Of the day and night and bright weather, he did choose occasions for getting a little above the lower shadows, but being at all times liable to be called by his electric bell, and at such times listening for it with redoubled anxiety, the relief 
was less than I would suppose. He took me into his box, where there was a fire, a desk for an official book in which he had to make certain entries, a telegraphic instrument with its dial face and needles, and the little bell of which he had spoken. On my trusting that he would excuse the remark, that he had been well educated and, I hoped I might say without offense, perhaps educated above the station. He observed that instances of slight incongruity in such wise would rarely be found wanting among large bodies of men, that he had heard it was so in the workhouses, in the police force, even in that last desperate resource, the army, and he knew it was so more or less in any great railway staff. He had been, when he was young, if I could believe it, sitting in that hut, he scarcely could himself a student of natural philosophy, and had attended lectures, but he had run wild and misused his opportunities and gone down and never risen again. He had no complaint to offer about that. He had made his bed and he lay upon it. It was far too late to make another. All that I have here condensed, he said in a quiet manner, with his grave dark regards divided between me and the fire. He threw in the word, sir, from time to time, especially when he referred to his youth, as though to request me to understand that he claimed to be nothing but what I found him. He was several times interrupted by the little bell and had to read off messages and send replies. Once he had to stand without the door and display a flag as a train passed and make some verbal communication to the driver. In the discharge of his duties, I observed him to be remarkably exact and vigilant, breaking off his discourse at a syllable and remaining silent until what he had to do was done. In a word, I should have set this man down as one of the safest of men to be employed in that capacity. But for the circumstances that while he was speaking to me, he twice broke off with a falling color, turned his face towards the little bell, when it did not ring, opened the door of the hut, which was kept shut to exclude the unhealthy damp, and looked out towards the red light near the mouth of the tunnel. On both of these occasions he came back to the fire with the inexplicable air upon him, which I had remarked without being able to define when we were so far asunder. Said I when I rose to leave him, you almost make me think that I have met with a contented man. I am afraid I must acknowledge that I said it to lead him on. I believe I used to be so, he rejoined in the low voice in which he had first spoken. But I am troubled, sir. I am troubled. He would have recalled the words if he could. He had said them, however, and I took them up quickly. With what? What is your trouble? It is very difficult to impart, sir. It is very, very difficult to speak of. If ever you make me another visit, I will try to tell you. But I expressively intend to make you another visit. Say, when shall it be? I go up early in the morning, and I shall be on again. At 10 a.m. tomorrow night, sir. Well, then I shall come at 11. He thanked me and went out the door with me. I'll show my white light, sir, he said in his peculiarly low voice, till you have found your way up. When you have found it, don't call out. And when you're out at the top, don't call out. His manner seemed to make the place strike colder to me. But I said no more than very well. And when you come down tomorrow night, don't call out. Let me ask you a parting question. What made you cry, hello below there, tonight? Heaven knows, said I. I, I cried something to that effect. No, to that effect, sir. Those were the very words. I know them well. Admit those were the very words I said them, no doubt, because I saw you below. 
For no other reason, what other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that they were conveyed to you in any supernatural way? No. He wished me good night and held up his light, and I walked by the side of it down the line of rails with a very disagree disagreeable sensation of a train coming behind me, until I found the path. It was easier to mount than to descend, and I got back to my inn without any adventure. Punctual to my appointment, I placed my foot on the first notch of the zigzag the next night as the distant clocks were striking eleven. He was waiting for me at the bottom, with his white light on. I have not called out, I said, when we came close together. May I speak now? By all means, sir. Good night, then, and here's my hand. Good night, sir, and here's mine. And with that, we walked side by side to his little box, entered it, closed the door, and sat down by the fire. I have made up my mind, sir, he began, bending forward as soon as we were seated and speaking in a tone but a little above a whisper, that you shall not have to ask me twice what troubles me. I took you for someone else yesterday evening. That troubles me. That mistake? No. That's someone else. Who, who is it? I don't know. Like me? I don't know. I never saw the face. The left arm is across the face, and the right arm is waved, violently waved, this way. I followed his actions with my eyes, and it was the action of an arm gesticulating with the utmost passion and vehemence. As if to say, for God's sake, clear the way. One moonlit night, said the man, I was sitting here when I heard a voice cry, Hello, below there. I started up, looking from that door, and saw this someone else standing by the red light near the tunnel, waving as I just now showed you. The voice, voice seemed hoarse with shouting, and it cried, Look out, look out. And then again, Hello, below there. Look out. I caught up my lamp and turned it on red, and I ran towards the figure, calling, What's wrong? What has happened? For it stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. I advanced so close upon it that I wondered as to its keeping the sleeve across its eyes. I ran right up to it and had my hand stretched out to pull the sleeve away when it was gone. Into the tunnel, said I? No. Oh. I ran into the tunnel 500 yards. I stopped and I held my lamp above my head and saw the figure of the measured distance. I saw the wet stains stealing down the walls and trickling through the arch. I ran out again faster than I had run in, for I had a mortal abhorrence of the place upon me, and I looked all around in the red light with my own red light. I went up the iron ladder to the galley above it. And I came down again, and I ran back here, and I telegraphed both ways, and alarm has been given. Is anything wrong? The answer came back both ways. All well. Resisting the slow touch of a frozen finger tracing out my spine, I showed him how this figure must be the deception of his sense of sight, and how that figures originating in diseases of the delicate nerve fibers that minister to the functions of the eye were known to have often troubled patients, some of whom had become conscious of the nature of their affliction and had even proven by experiments upon themselves. As to an imaginary cry, said I, I do but listen for a moment to the wind in this unnatural valley while we speak so low, and to the wild harp it makes of the telegraph wires. That was all very well, he returned, after we had sat listening for a while. And he ought to know something of the wind and the wires. He who so often passed long winter nights there alone and watching, but he would beg to remark that he had not finished. I asked his pardon, and he slowly added these words, touching my arm. Within six hours after the appearance, the memorable accident on this line happened, and within ten hours, the dead and the wounded were brought along through this tunnel, 
over the spot where the figure had stood. A disagreeable shudder crept over me, but I did my best against it. It was not to be denied, I rejoined, that this was a remarkable coincidence, calculated deeply to impress his mind. But it was unquestionable that remarkable coincidence, coincidences did continually occur, and they must be taken into account in dealing with such a subject. Though to be sure, I must admit, I added, for I thought I saw that he was going to bring the objection to bear upon me. Men of a common sense did not allow much for coincidences in making the ordinary calculations of life. He again begged a remark that he had not finished. And I begged his pardon for be being betrayed into interruptions. This, he said again, laying his hand upon my arm and glancing over his shoulder with hollow eyes, was just a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I recovered from the surprise and shock when one morning, as the day was breaking, I, standing at the door, looking towards the red light, I saw the specter again. He stopped with a fixed look at me. Did it cry out? No, it was silent. It, did it wave its arm? No, it leaned against the shaft of the light, with both hands before its face, like this. Once more I followed his actions with my eyes. It was an action of mourning. I had seen such an attitude in stone figures on tombs. Did you go up to it? I came in and sat down, partly to collect my thoughts, partly because it had turned me faint. And when I went out the door again, daylight was above me and the ghost was gone. But nothing followed. Nothing came of this. He touched me on the arm with his forefinger twice or thrice, giving a ghastly nod each time. That very day, as a train came out of the tunnel, I noticed that a carriage window on my side would look like a confusion of hands and heads and something waved. I saw it just in time to signal the driver to stop and he shut off and put his brake on, but the train drifted past here a hundred and fifty yards and more. I ran after it, and as I went along, I heard terrible screams and cries. A beautiful young lady had died instantaneously in one of the compartments, and was brought in here, and laid down on this floor between us. Involuntarily, I pushed my chair back as I looked from the boards at which he pointed to himself. True, sir, true, precisely as it happens, so I tell it. I could think of nothing to say to any purpose, and my mouth was very dry. The wind in the wires took up the story with a long, lamenting wail. He resumed, Now, sir, mark this, and judge how my mind is troubled. The spectre came back a week ago. Ever since it has been here now and again, by fits and starts. At the light? The danger light. What does it seem to do? He repeated, if possible, with increased passion and vehemence, that former gesticulation of, for God's sake, clear the way. Then he went on, I have no peace or rest for it. He calls to me for many minutes together in an agonizing manner. Below there, look out, look out. It stands waving to me. It rings my little bell. I caught it that. Did, did it ring your bell yesterday? Yesterday evening when I was here and, and you went to the door twice? Why, see, said I, how your imagination misleads you. My eyes were on the bell. My eyes were on the bell and my ears were open to the bell. And if I am a living man, it did not ring at those times, nor not at any other times, except for when it was rung in the natural course of physical things by the station communicating with you. He shook his head. I have never made a mistake as to that yet, sir. 
I have never confused the specter's ring with that of a man's. The ghost ring is a strange vibration in that bell that derives from nothing else, and I have not asserted that the bell stirs to the eyes. I don't wonder that you failed to hear it, but I heard it. And did the specter seem to be there when you looked out? Was there? Both times? He repeated firmly, both times. Will you come to the door with me and look for it now? He bit his under lip as though he was somewhat unwilling, but arose and I opened the door and stood on the step while he stood at the doorway. There was the danger light, there was the dismal mouth of the tunnel, and there was the high, wet stone walls of the cutting. There were stars above them. Do you see it? I asked. Taking particular note of his face, and his eyes were prominent and strained, but not very much more so perhaps than my, than my own had been when I directed them earnestly towards the same spot. No, he answered. It is not there. Agreed, said I, and we went in again and shut the door and resumed our seats. I was thinking how to best improve this advantage, if it might be called one, when he took up the conversation in such a matter-of-course way, so assuming that there could be no serious question of fact between us, that I felt myself placed in the weakest of positions. By this time you will fully understand, sir, he said. That what troubles me so dreadfully is the question, what does the specter mean? I was not sure, I told him. I told him that I did not fully understand. What is it warning against, he said, ruminating with his eyes on the fire, and only by time turning them on me. What is the danger? Where is the danger? There is danger overhanging somewhere on the line. Some dreadful calamity will happen. It is not to be doubted this third time, but what has gone before, but surely this is a cruel haunting of me. What can I do? He pulled out his handkerchief and wiped the drops from his, his heated forehead. If I telegraph danger on either side of me, or on both, I can give no reason. He went on, wiping the palms of his hands. I should get into trouble and do no good. They would think I was mad. This is the way it would work. Message. Danger. Take care. Answer. What danger? Where? Message. Don't know, but for God's sake, take care. They would displace me. What else could they do? His pain of mind was most pitiable to see. It was the mental torture of a conscientious man oppressed beyond endurance by an unintelligible responsibility involving life. When it first stood under the danger light, he went on putting his dark hair back from his head and drawing his hands outward across hook and across his temples in an extremely feverish distress. Why not tell me where the accident was to happen? If it must happen, why not tell me how it could be averted? If it could have been averted? When on its second coming, it hit its face. Why not tell me instead she is going to die? Let them keep her at home. If it came on those two occasions only to show me that its warnings were true and so to prepare me for the third, why not warn me plainly now? And I, Lord, help me. A mere poor signal man on the, in the solitary station. Why not go to somebody with credit to be believed and power to act? When I saw him in this state, I saw that for the poor man's sake, as well as for the public safety, what I had to do. For the time I had to compose his mind, therefore setting aside all question of reality or unreality between us, I represented to him that Whoever thoroughly discharges his duty must do well, and that at least it was to his comfort that he understood his duty.
that we did not understand these confounding appearances. In this effort I succeeded far better than in the attempt to reason him out of his conviction. He became calm, and the occupation incidental to his post as the night advanced, then began making larger demands on his attention. And I left him at two in the morning. I had offered to stay through the night, but he would not hear of it. That I more than once looked back at the red light as I ascended the pathway. That I did not like the red light, and that I should have slept but poorly if my bed had been under it, I see no reason to conceal. Nor did I like the two sequences of the accident and the dead girl. I see no reason to conceal that either. But what ran most in my thought was the consideration of how I ought to act, having become the recipient of this disclosure. I had proved the man to be intelligent, vigilant, painstaking, and exact, but how long might he remain so in his state of mind? Though in a subordinate position, still he held the most important trust. And would I, for instance, like to stake my own life on the chance of his continuing to execute it with precision? Unable to overcome a feeling that there would be something treacherous in my communicating what he had told me to his superiors in the company without first being plain with him and proposing a middle course to him, I ultimately resolved to offer to accompany him, otherwise keeping his secret for the present, to the wisest medical practitioner we could hear of in those parts, and to take his opinion. A change in any time his time on duty would come round next night. He had apprised me, and he would be off an hour or two after sunrise, and on again soon after sunset. I had appointed to return accordingly. Next evening was a lovely evening, and I walked out early to enjoy it. The sun was not yet quite down when I traversed the field path near the top of the deep cutting. I would extend my walk for an hour, I said to myself, half an hour on and half an hour back and it would then be time to go to my signal man's box. Before pursuing my stroll, I stepped to the brink of and mechanically looked down from the point where I had first seen him. I cannot describe the thrill that seized upon me when, close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw the appearance of a man with his left sleeve across his eye, passionately waving his right arm. The nameless horror that had oppressed me passed in a moment, for in a moment I saw that this appearance was of a man. Indeed, and that there was a little group of other men standing a short distance, to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he had made. Danger light was not yet lighted, and against its shaft a little low hut, entirely new to me, had been made of some wooden supports and a tarpaulin. It looked no bigger than a bed. And an irresistible sense that something was wrong. With a flashing self-reproachful fear that fatal mischief had come of my leaving the man there and causing no one to be sent to overlook or correct the did, I descended the notch path with all the speed I could make. What's the matter? I asked the men. Signal man killed this morning, sir. Not the man belonging to the box. Yes, sir. Not the man I know. You will recognize him, sir, if you know him, said the man, who spoke for the others, and solemnly uncovering his own head and raising the end of the tarpaulin, for his face is not is quite composed. Oh, how did this happen? How did this happen? I asked, turning from one to another as the hut closed in again. He was cut down by an engine, sir. No man in England knew his work better, but somehow he was not clear of the outer rail. It was just a broad day. He had struck the light, had the lamp in his hand. As the engine came out of the tunnel, his back was towards her, and she cut him down. That man drove her and was showing how it happened. Show the gentleman, Tom. The man who wore a rough, dark dress stepped up to the former place at the mouth of the tunnel. Coming round the curve into the tunnel, sir, he said, I saw him at the end, like as if I had seen him down a perspective glass. There was no time to check speed, and I knew him to be very careful. As he didn't seem to take heed of the whistle, I shut it off, and when we were running down upon him, I called to him as loud as I could call. What did you say? I said, 
Below there, look out. Look out for God's sake. Clear the way. I started. Ah, it was dreadful. Dreadful time, sir. I never left off calling them. I put this arm before my eyes, not to see, and I waved this arm to the last, but it was no use. Without prolonging the narrative to dwell on any one of its curious circumstances more than on any other, I may in closing and point out the coincidence that the warning of the engine driver included not only the words which the unfortunate signal man had repeated to me as haunting him, but also the words which I myself, not he, had attached, and that only in my own mind, to the gesticulation he had imitated. Happy Halloween, my friends.